Excellent. I heard Professor Park's lecture was phenomenal. <laughs> awesome. I'm very sad that I missed it now. <laughs> but um, excellent. So what I wanted to do for the next hour is help you approach a very daunting task. And I think that some of the advice I'm going to give you today is one of those oh yeah moments like more of a uh, oh right instead of something that uh, you've never thought of before but I really want to give you some kind of foundation that you can use to approach such a daunting task okay so everyone has some lecture notes for this is that correct you have the handout cool because oh do you just have a print of the PowerPoint or do you have the lecture notes as well. Oh, you just have the PowerPoint. That's OK. We can work with that. Um, OK, so what I want to do first is just a simple word association activity. And the reason for this is I want you to start thinking a little bit out of the box. I think that when a lot of us are taking on these big projects, we winnow really quickly. But I want you to think about expanding a little before you winnow, OK? So we're going to do some just word association activities, also to get you guys talking. <laughs> um, but when you see this word, I just want you to yell out the first word that comes to your mind, OK? Are you ready? Mountain. Ooh, green tree, excellent. Art. Ooh, art museum. Hmm? Oh. Oh, art, very cool. What about salt? Salty. Salty, ooh. <laughs> See, good. Any others? White. Ah, excellent, excellent. Tree. Mm, nature, green, good. Any others from the back? Fresh air. Ooh, fresh air. Oh. oh, we need fresh air. What about ice? Cold, of course. <laughs> we all have a similar word association with that one. Ooh, ice latte. I think Professor Cho needs some coffee. I'm with you. <laughs> what about book? Ooh, that one we had a lot of varied responses. So it's interesting how our brains work, how sometimes we think of the same ideas and sometimes we have this varied idea, um, a lot of different ways to approach the same thing. But I wanted to just do that to get you seeing how all of us, even though we have these simple concepts, really approach things from our own different ways. Even uh, things such as that book association we just did. We had a lot of different responses, right? And that's OK. But how can we use that to approach writing a paper? That's, that's the question we're asking today. Uh, and the first thing I want to do is is take it back a little bit. I don't want to talk about writing a paper, because writing a paper is daunting and tiring and exhausting. I want to talk about preparing to write a paper, preparing to start. Um, so what I want is to focus for this first section on organizing your thoughts, getting yourself out of the stress of this huge task and into an organizational strategy that you like, that helps you think, that helps you approach the material, and that will ultimately write your paper for you, right? So like with this method, what I'm trying to do is make sure that the paper that you write is the easiest part, <laughs> right, instead of the hardest part. Because normally we think about it as like, the hardest part, but no. Let's prepare to write first. So organizing. Why do we organize our thoughts? What is going to be a reason why you need a good organizational strategy? Why do you need a good organizational strategy? You can outline your thoughts. Yeah, outline your thoughts. Uh, great. What else? I mean, it's more than just outline your thoughts. Organization is more than just having an outline. It is, it's structuring. It's giving you everything you need to do before you actually do it. It sets you up for success at every single step of the way. If you are organized, 
You have no problems with deadlines. You have no problems with figuring out how things connect together. You have no problems with understanding the large picture that is this paper, okay? So organizing is so important. Organization, or, blah, 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 blah. organization, <laughs> we speak English. Uh, organization is going to help you keep track of your sources. Now, when you're writing a paper, a lot of times the first thing we do is find sources. Sources, 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 sources. And if you're like me, often what that means is you have a bookshelf of books and papers and just chaos. <laughs> and that is the organizational strategy. It's not the best organizational strategy. There's a better way, <laughs> I promise. There's a better way to keep track of your sources uh, in a way that really makes sense and is really approachable. Organization helps you draw parallels between these sources. So sometimes we might think, oh, OK, I've got my bookshelf. On the top shelf will be this topic. Second shelf will be this topic. Third shelf will be this topic. Look at this. <laughs> it's beautiful, perfect organizational strategy. But um, what we're going to talk about today in our strategies is more of manipulating these sources, understanding not just what each source says, but how they work together and how they create the overall concept or topic that you're talking about. And then having a good organizational strategy will help you expand on your topic in a clear, logical process. It will help you track these connections, track these connecting ideas, and ultimately create a large-scale project in and of itself. OK, so which strategy is best for me? Let's talk about some of those strategies. And some of these you will recognize. At least I hope you will recognize. Ooh, we'll see, we'll see. OK, so the first strategy you can use to organize your thoughts for a research paper is just a research summary. Has anyone written one of these before? No. OK, that's cool. Um, I've written one, but you know, teach their own. So a research summary is basically a document. And in this document, you can organize your sources in whatever way you want. You can organize them chronologically. You can organize them by section of your paper. You can organize them by author. But what a research summary does is that it's a single document that's easily searchable that lists the citation of the source, uh, any relevant quotes or keywords from that source, and then a summary of the source itself. And you might be asking, but wait a second. So I'm writing a paper to write a paper. <laughs> there is a reason for this, though. So every time you get a source, you will add it to your research summary. And then if you want to remember a source or remember where to find something, you do Control F in the document, type in what you want to find, and it's there. It's there in the summation. It tells you what source it is, right? We're creating an organizational strategy. We're not writing a paper, we're organizing our thoughts. Hmm? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so a research summary includes a citation for your source. It's already mapped out in APA format or whatever format you're using, APA. Uh, and it should include a brief one and a half to one page summary of what that source says. Why is that source on your research list? And you keep this research summary as a digital file. Right? And it's a way to quickly access all of your research. It's like creating your own library. Right? Every time you find a source, you put it in your research summary. And then when you need to find that source again, control F, boom, boom, boom. Hey, look, this is the source I need. Right? So it's very easy to re-access the information that you've read with a research summary. So it might look something like this, only with a long paper. So this is one example of what you would do for an entry in your summary. We have at our top our citation itself. This is also going to be great when you're writing your paper. You just copy and paste the citations in. Um, but this is a canal and swain theoretical basis of communicative approaches to second language teaching and testing. It's a book. 
Um, and then you see here that we have our keywords, which are the main ideas of this source, why I'm using this source, what this source is trying to tell me, and then a short summary, right? What does this source do? So yes, you're writing each of these entries after every single source you read, and yes, that's daunting. But having this piece of paper when you go to write is going to make your life so much easier. Because then you think, ah, dang it, I need a source about L2 teaching. Type in L2 teaching, boom, 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 six sources pop up. Now you know what you need for that section of your paper, okay? So it's a way to organize your thoughts beforehand to make your life easier later, right? We're making the writing process the easiest part of writing your paper. Okay, the next way you can organize your thoughts index cards. Anyone use this method before? Yeah, it's a classic. This is the number one, mm, I don't know, most classical way to organize your thoughts. Every single one of us, our first research paper in what, sixth, sixth grade, your teacher says, oh, make an index card with each source on it so that you can track it later. Like this is the classic organizational strategy. It's very straightforward. One card, one source, and there's a lot of good reasons to have these index cards instead, because you can play with these index cards in a lot of different ways. So we've got our one index card, it's got our source on it, our citation, our keywords, our summary, any important quotes, anything we need. Now we can manipulate these in a lot of ways. We can physically move them around in our space to see where connecting ideas are coming from. We can color code them to show different connecting ideas. So we can physically manipulate it. So if you're more dexterous, if you're more of someone that really wants to physically connect and touch with your material, um, this would be a really good strategy for you, right? You're someone that likes to work with their hands, handwriting the sources, hand manipulating. Okay, so Swain here goes in with Chomsky here, boom, boom, and you can physically move those around, okay, and see where these connecting ideas are. So again, on the index card, the citation. The citation because it's mostly annoying for us when we write the paper to write out a long list of citations. So if you have it already written, copy, paste it into your final document. Again, a summary, and then any quotes, um, and with page numbers that you might need to use later. So I did something like this. So this is the author, Noland, the page from the quote, uh, any kind of parent that are paraphrasing that you need of the source. You can put anything on your index card. Again, it's just a way for you to organize your thoughts to where you have everything on hand, everything ready to go, and writing is easy. Okay, so, organizing, Organi organization. Uh, next, another classic, the binder. And does anyone a binder person? They love a good binder. Yeah, we have a binder person, all right. I love the smell of a new binder. You're just like, I smell the organization. I smell the efficiency. Binders are great. We can use them in a lot of ways similar to the index cards and to other sections. Um, you can handwrite little summaries of each source or you can type them up and just print them out, put them in your binder. You can organize your binder into different sections, color-coded sections based on the concepts of your paper, the sections of your paper. You can organize them however you like. You can print the sources, the actual source, if it's an article, stick it in the binder with a summary, everything. Ah, so laid out, so wonderful, <laughs> so easy to access. Okay, so you print your sources, put them into the different sections. But for this, even though you're using a binder, you should still write a summary, right? You should still give yourself that reminder of that article. Because when push comes to shove and you are 10 pages into, I don't know, a 100 page report and you're thinking, oh my gosh, what was that source, that one idea I thought about at that one time? 
it can be on your handwritten source, right? So, and so it's a lot easier to find than like shuffling through all of the articles again. It's like, where's that one highlighted section about that one idea, right? You're pre-organizing so that your life is easier later. So we have a cover page for each source with, again, citation, keyword, summary, any important quotes and their corresponding page numbers, and with a binder, just like index cards, manipulation. If you're, again, more of a, a tactile person, then you can move these sources around and see different ways to approach this organization. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, OK, this is a lot. So it might look like this, wow. right? Color-coded, organized binder. Now, at this point, how many of you are thinking, geez, this is a lot of work? Yeah, show of hands. Yeah, right. It's a lot of work. But we're doing the work up front because we're spreading the workload out. Most of us, me included, we go to write a big paper. We print off a bunch of sources. We read them. We don't organize. And then we start that paper. And we get overwhelmed because we've backloaded the brunt of the work. We've waited until the last minute to do the most work. What I'm trying to tell you is front load your work. Make the paper writing process the easiest part of the process. Front load the work, organize your thoughts, create structures. I promise your life will be easier. I promise, I promise. Now there is one more method, and this is my favorite method. This is a method that I've used before, and it's a mind map. Has anyone done a mind map? Yeah, we've got some mind mappers. All right, I love a mind map. Um, if you're not great with technology, you might not like a mind map. <laughs> this might not be your best strategy, and that's OK. But if you're more of a tech-savvy person or more of a technological person, I love a mind map. They're very, they're not the easiest to create, but once you've created it, they're the easiest to pull information back out of. So this one is for the more tech savvy of us, so those a little bit more comfortable with our technology. And just like any brainstorming map, a mind map starts with your central concept. This can just be the title of your paper or your central theme, whatever it is. And the great thing about a mind map is as you gather sources, you can physically draw in those connections to your main idea. You can color code them. You can add in quotes. You can add in hyperlinks. You can organize everything into this one mind map, this one document to where it's um, connected to each other already. And you've already got each section of your paper basically planned out by the time you write it. So again, in the mind map, we have to include the citation because it's going to be a great way to recall information as well as keywords and a short summary. Mind maps are great because just like index cards, you can manipulate them any way you want. You can have different ideas and connect this thought to this thought. You can create links across the map. And I'll show you what I mean. So don't, don't feel too stressed if you don't quite get what I'm um, talking about. But you're creating this single, encompassing, visual relationship with your paper such that your paper is basically already written, right? Here's your introduction section, all of the things you need for that. Here's your research section, all of the things you need for that. It's already mapped out for you. And it might look like something like this, right? So you can see here that this mind map is fairly color-coded. There's each of these different sections. They all stem from this one main idea. This is kind of a level one mind map. Most mind mapping software, you can create links inside of it. You can create a hover over content. You can create all of these different sub pieces of information within this mind map to where when you go to write, you say, OK, well, let's see. Um, in this section, I'm using the red. So you can already see where these concepts are working together. You've already thought about it. Usually the lines, the connecting lines, you can make notes in there about why these two ideas are connected together. Like it's how you can approach organizing such a huge amount of data and information. So I love a mind map. 
You've made one. What did you think about a mind map? But it takes time. They do take time. But I encourage that. Take your time now to have less time later, right? What about you? You said you had made a mind map before as well. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So this is a way of looking at your information, just like she said, in a new way. You're stepping back from the articles and you're looking at their ideas. You're stepping back from your bookshelf of sources and your 30 books that you've been reading about this topic, and you're looking at them as ideas and how those ideas work together and how those ideas create your paper and create your structure. So a mind map. I love a mind map. OK. What do you think at this point? Yeah, this is our next step. <laughs> how to research. But we've just gone through four organizational strategies. Is there another? Is there another way that you organize your thoughts when writing a paper? Is this the first time anyone has told you to organize your thoughts before writing a paper? How many of you do the bulleted outline? Bulleted outline? Just an outline? Really, none of us. How many of you do? Oh, yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Does anyone have a strategy? No. Okay, well, interesting. Please choose a strategy. <laughs> Any strategy that works for you. These are not the only things that you can do to organize your thoughts. Uh, Professor Joe, can I put you on the spot? Okay. Can I put you on the spot? Sure. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. How do you organize your thoughts? Because you write a lot of papers, and they're very good papers. They're very clear, they're very well structured. How do you do it? I you know, check the previous, you know, previous article. Okay. And they find out some floor, sure. and they come up with a better idea. Ah. ah, but how do you go about sectioning your thoughts? I mean, there's already a pre-selected uh, sectioning concept for each type. First, I write on my main idea. Okay. And the other thing automatically follows. Ah. So my approach is quite the opposite of what you are presenting about. Uh huh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. so Time-wise. Mm -hmm. So in the long scale, your presentation makes sense, but we are running out of time. So sometimes my idea. Uh huh. Chogi Sock is a do it fast, but do it well. Do it fast and well. Mine is more of, like he said, the, the long game. This is more of a you know that your thesis is going to take you six months to a year to write. You haven't started researching yet. You don't really have um, any foundational research already done. Like, Chogi Sock's been in the industry for tens of years, decades. He's read a lot of research. He knows his material inside and out. But for a lot of us, this is our first big paper, right? So how do we approach that huge breadth of information that we intake when preparing for this first paper, right? So that was, that's, that's my approach. That's what I'm trying to help you solve. Like, how do you approach when you're reading 30 papers and 10 books for the first time and you're taking in all of that information, how do you turn around and make that an output, right? So, by organization. Yeah. Cool, okay, <laughs> let's get into the second half. So you've figured out what works for you. You're like, okay, I'm going to use index cards. They're simple, they're visceral, I can write them out, I can easily keep track of everything I've read and everything I need to know. Um, I know what organizational strategy I'm going to use, where do I find stuff? Where do I find stuff? Where do, what do you use right now? Anyone? Where do you find your sources? Google. Google. Yeah. <laughs> hmm? library. The library. Excellent. Anywhere else? Neighbor. 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 There we go. 
Excellent. Yeah, like we know the basics. We know how to do our research. Um, so before you research, have an organizational strategy. I encourage you. Figure out how you're going to organize these sources to keep track of each single one of them. And then as you read and find your new sources, your organizational strategy gives you a place to put them. It gives you something to do with each piece of information that you read. Add it to your organization. Keep on top of your organization. It will be so much easier to find information later. So step number one in researching. Go to the library. Go to the library. Because question, who are the best researchers in the world? They have a degree in research. Librarians. Librarians are the best researchers in the world. Now, they don't write papers about their research, but they know every single tactic to find information. They know every website, every strategy, every potential keyword. A librarian's degree is literally in finding where information lives, right? So who are the best researchers? Librarians. So ask your local librarian, OK, can you help me? I'm having trouble with this. So go to the library. You can use the library search engine to find books, to find articles, to find sources. And the library is free. We like free. <laughs> we like free. And at the library, you can make your copies. You can get everything organized. Put them in your organizational method. And also, the librarian has a career of researching, right? You have somebody there that you can say, hey, how do I find out more information on generative grammar? She'll be able to help you. Or he. There's boy librarians. But go to the library. First step. Second step. <laughs> Just like she said, Google it. <laughs> Google it. Now question, is Google the only search engine? No. <laughs> no, there's a million of them. But it feels like Google is the only search engine sometimes. Because we use Google as a verb now, right? It's not just, oh, go to google.com and search for your information. Google has become the verb. Yeah. Google it. Google it. So it just feels like Google is the only search engine, but it's really not. So Google it. There are a lot of academic search engines, a whole lot of them. Uh, Google Scholar, of course, is one. JSTOR, Jern, Core. If you just Google it, you're going to come up with a lot of these different academic article websites. Now, the problem is, how do you know which ones are good? How do you know which ones are relevant? You have to read them. You have to, you have to go from there. But one thing you should keep in mind is that you don't actually need to pay for the articles you find. There is a trick that I do, which I don't know if it's legal. I think it's legal. <laughs> but <laughs> basically, when you, you find an article, you find an article that interests you that you really think is going to be important to your paper, figure out who wrote it, who's the author, find their contact information. You can Google their name, and it'll show up where they work, if they're still alive, which Hopefully you're using relevant sources, so they should still be alive. You can email them. You can email them and say, hey, can I have this article? Academics, especially academics in the US, and I think here as well, don't make any money from publishing. Like, If you pay the publisher $30 for their paper, zero of that goes to the professor. So if you email the professor and say, hey, can I like, have this article? They're going to email it to you. Because they get just as much money if they send it to you through email as they would if you bought it from a journal. This actually works. <laughs> I've done this. You can get it directly from the source instead of paying. So you can get a little bit creative. Also, there are a lot of free articles out there. Um, but again, are they the highest quality? Uh, you'll have to read them. I don't know. It's up to you. OK, so we Googled it. Yes, yes or neighbored it. The third step of researching, follow the rabbit hole. What does that mean? What's a rabbit hole? This is a good idiomatic expression that stems from a movie, a book, really. 
by Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Follow the rabbit hole. So what's a rabbit hole? Yeah, kind of. It's kind of like an unknown world. It is an unknown path that's already laid out in front of you, but you don't quite know what that path is yet. So a lot of us will find when we're researching um, that we just keep getting all of these semi-relevant articles. And this goes back to our organizational strategy because semi-relevant articles can go on the outskirts of your organization uh, and you can find ways to connect them through if you need them. But a rabbit hole is a trust in the trail. So you're researching, you've got your highly relevant articles, and then you've got your semi-relevant articles that start popping in and relevant keywords. And you do kind of want to check those out, right? Just to see the breadth of the content, right? So a rabbit hole, follow the rabbit hole. It's also just a cool phrase. OK, so follow the rabbit hole. As you do your research, you're going to start to find articles that are related but not exactly on topic, but, but in. I don't know what in is. In seems to be a typo. Related, but not exactly is what that's going to say. And as you find and you read these new sources, you can immediately add them to your organizational strategy. But you can also make notes in that organizational strategy of like, OK, this is a related topic. This is relevant, but it's not 100% exactly what I'm trying to do, but it is a related concept. And keep top of your organization. Organization! I feel like that's going to be the word of the day, right? So let's test it out. Let's say you're approaching this thesis. There's a couple questions you're going to ask. How am I doing on time? Oh my gosh, I'm doing so early on time. <laughs> Good. I hope you have a lot of questions because we're going to talk about it. So let's test it out. How do you start the process? Well, you ask the first question, what kind of paper am I going to write? Question, who knows what kind of papers there are? There's three main types of papers in academia. Anyone know them? Qualitative, quantitative, and mixed method. Good. So you have to figure out what type of paper are you writing? What goes in with the research that you're doing? Now, I've mostly talked about other people's sources. So I'm going to say, just for the sake of argument, that we're going to write a qualitative paper. So I know that I'm going to write a qualitative paper because I'm not making quantitative data on my own. So I'm going to write a qualitative paper. And then I ask myself, how am I going to organize my research? How are you going to organize your research? Perfect. Yeah. So, a research summary. A research. Yeah, a list of your research. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I usually use the keywords uh, what I want to, and then I I have the summary. Ah. Yeah. That is to organize my research. Yeah. After do the research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. So I'm, I think, unless I'm wrong, it's a research summary. You make one file with all of your sources, all of your summaries, all of your citations, you organize them chronologically, and then you have one file, right? Where all of your research is already talked about. Yeah, research summary. Perfect. You're questioning that. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. We'll come back. How will you organize your thoughts? What strategy kind of appealed to you as like your method of approaching this much data? It could be anything. <laughs> Methodology. What do you mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we have to, uh, we have to choose one of them. Right. So that is the way uh, we can organize our research. Is that right? No. <laughs> 
That's how you organize your paper. I think. I'm not sure if I know what you mean. So you're saying once you choose the style of paper, it inherently gives you your organizational strategy for your sources or for the paper? I'm confused. Interesting. Okay. Uh, okay, so what, what, how are you going to organize your thoughts, though? What do you think? How do you already organize your thoughts? I didn't think this would be a hard question, <laughs> but. So we've chosen our style of paper, and because we've chosen our style of paper, the paper itself already has the structure of the paper, the organization, right. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about organizing our thoughts. Like that's, that's not, you can't use the structure of the paper to organize your sources, right? You can use the structure of your paper to organize your topic and your concepts and how you're going to write the paper, but that's not how you keep track of all of the sources that you're going to use, right? You see what I mean? Interesting. Okay, well, I'm gonna use a mind map. Let's move on from this. I'm gonna use a mind map. I'm gonna use it, a mind map by concept to organize it. I could also organize this by section of the paper in my mind map, right? And that would be a really simple way to organize it in that regard, to do by section of the paper, because those are already laid out for you, right? Okay, where are you gonna start your research process? I didn't think these were hard questions. <laughs> Should we play a game or something? Everyone's so quiet. Thank you. You're going to go to the library. I'm not gonna, <laughs> it's, it's not a trick question, I promise. Uh, no, you're going to start your research at the library. Why? There's libraries everywhere. They have a ton of resources. They have a professional researcher at your beck and call. They're free. <laughs> All of these things are great. Of course, you're going to start at the library, OK? So we have our style of paper picked out. We know how we're going to keep track of our sources that we're collecting. We go to the library. We Google search them. We put each source into our organizational strategy as we read them. Oh, sorry, I already answered this question. Oh gosh, I'm a terrible teacher. Giving away the answers. Ay, yeah, yeah. What do I do when I find a source? Yeah, I put it in my organizational strategy. I read it. I determine, does this work for me? Does this not work for me? If it works for me, I write down, okay, this is good, this is good, this is the keyword, this is the summary, these are the quotes I like, and I put it in my organizational strategy. I put it in my binder. I make an index card, I put it in my mind map, I put it on my research summary, I put it in my organization. So I keep track of it, hold on to it forever. Okay, so what do I do? I'll put it in my mind map. So for this, uh, this example, I'm in a mind map. I'm gonna do a mind map, I like a mind map, why not? So I'm gonna put it in my mind map. I found the source, I read the source, the source is good, I put it in my mind map. Right, so I can see it again later and understand, okay, that's what that paper said, that's what that article said. Okay, what information should I put in the mind map when I add my source? A summary, a summary of the research, what else? Hmm? Keywords, paraphrase, exactly. Paraphrase the article, summarize it, Keyword, citation. Don't forget the citation. Especially if you do a mind map, you can copy and paste. Copy and paste, right? You can copy and paste that citation from your mind map into your paper. So a source citation, keywords, and a short summary. You can also include quotes and page numbers, right? There's a lot of things you can put in a mind map. OK. What the heck does that look like? <laughs> so I did a mind map, right? So what does a mind map look like? We saw one already. I want to focus more on the details, and that's why we're seeing the second version of a mind map, because you can see here that there's a lot of hidden information. This is not 
the only thing you're putting in your mind map. In fact, for each little dot here, for each little section, we are only seeing a keyword, a single keyword, a single concept. But you'll notice a couple things. Let's see, what do you want to talk about first? You want to talk about the little pictures, the little squares under the keyword? Let's talk about those first. Yeah? Okay. So you can see here that a lot of these main headings, like here, have these little boxes. What do you think's in those boxes? Yeah. So you've got this visual of your paper. But in this visual, you have the options to hide information. So here, it's not a link, but if we were to click on it, we would see the citation of all of the information about, in this case, carbohydrates, because this is someone else's mind map. This is not my mind map. But um, you, you would be able to see every single source relevant to that one topic, carbohydrates. Right? You can hide that information. So it doesn't impede your organization. It hides the details, but you still have those details organized there. And then the next thing I want to point out here is the lines. What do you notice about the lines? Hmm? Hmm. There's a lot of them. They connect different thoughts together. That's pretty easy. They have words in them. Some of these lines are broken out with words. So you can talk about the relationship between those two concepts and put that into your mind map. Again, we're like mapping out your paper before it's written. We're showing you everything you need to know. Another thing to notice about the lines is that you can connect thoughts that originally you thought were totally separate from each other, totally different ideas, totally different topics, but because this will allow you to connect those ideas, boom, now you have a visual representation of every research you've done, every source you've found, everything you've talked about, okay? Someone from like a mind mapping company should probably pay me for this lecture. <laughs> I feel like I've spent more time talking about, ah, oh, mind maps, they're amazing. <laughs> I love a mind map, but, okay. So we've got our sources, we've put them in our organizational strategy. In my case, it's a mind map. We've organized our thoughts, we've connected our ideas. So what's next? I mean, you can read it off of the thing, but like, what's next? Yeah, like writing. You got to write. You got to write. So um, a lot of us, like I said, this is the biggest part for us. But if you've organized your information properly and in a way that you can understand and recall really quickly, this should be really easy. You should already know what every single section of your paper looks like, what every single source for every single section looks like. You should have already, you know, you probably wrote in your summaries little snippets that you can use in your paper. Because as you're uh, connecting with these sources and reading these sources and understanding what they're saying, you're writing summaries of them, you're writing understandings of them, you're writing in questions that you have, you're organizing all of your thoughts beforehand, and then when you go to write, you already know where you're going with this. You already know what each section looks like. Yes? No. Yes? Yes! Okay, yes. Yes, you already know what it looks like. Um, now, when you go to write, how do you start? Do you just cover page, top to bottom, in order? Nah, you don't need to. You don't need to write it in order. I think a lot of us, we want to write it in order because we think, ah, this is the order of it, though. This is the natural progression. But each section of a paper, whatever paper you're writing, quantitative, qualitative, mixed methods, is different. It talks about different things. It's using different ideas and different sources. There's no reason to write it in order. What do you start with? I always start with, 
and I know this is not what you're supposed to do, I always, <laughs> I always start with the bibliography because it's very straightforward. Now, of course, later you have to double check your bibliography against what you wrote and make sure you've used all of those sources, but that's where I start because it's very straightforward and it's easy and everything's already there and I've already written out in my mind map, so copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Look at me, I wrote three pages today. No, I did not, <laughs> but it feels like a good place to start because it's so finite, it's so absolute that you think we're off to a good start. Yes, one section done. <laughs> um, so, but you can write any section in any order that you want. You can skip around, and that is why the organizational strategy is so important because you already see what that whole paper looks like. You can choose different sections to write on different days. Maybe you think, ah, today it's rainy. I feel very, I don't know, ennui. I'm going to write my introduction because it's very, you know, whatever you want, whatever works for your brain and your life, okay? So you can write in any order. And that's where that organizational strategy really helps you because you already see each section as its own thing. So you just take all those sources. That's what you're writing today, okay? So you're pulling them in. Another thing I suggest just as a, um, I don't know, just as a brain thought, use a cloud-based storage platform. Do you, does everyone know what I mean by a cloud-based storage platform? Hmm? Yeah, Evernote is one, yeah. Um, Microsoft OneDrive, I think. Google Drive, I do everything in Google Drive. Why would you use a cloud-based storage platform to write your paper? Why would that be a good idea? Let me back up a, let me back up a question. How many of you are comfortable with a cloud-based storage platform? You are very comfortable, you know how to use it, you know all the tricks, I see two hands. Okay, let's talk about what a cloud-based storage platform is. A cloud-based storage platform is a hard drive on the internet. So it's a way to save your files through the internet to where it's not actually on your physical home hard drive. It is stored in hyperspace? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it goes. The tubes, right? The internet tubes? Did you guys have that? No, so a cloud-based storage platform is an online storage platform. And the drive systems, the Google, Word, and all of those, have all the same functions as like Microsoft, Microsoft um, Word and everything. And also there's a Microsoft, there's OneDrive. The benefit of these is that you don't have to email yourself different versions of your document. You don't have to have six different copies of the document you're working on. Any computer that you log into, anywhere, has one document, and you continue to edit and work on that single document, and it saves automatically, so you don't have to remember to press save in case your power goes out and you lose 20 pages of a paper, which has happened to me before. But cloud-based storage platforms are good in that regard. You can be working on them on a plane, and it'll uh, save once you get internet, right? You can be working them at work, at home, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's still just Word. Right? It's still just a word processor, but you don't have to worry about losing it because it's saved for you in someone else's, I don't really know where it goes. Where does it go? It goes into the cloud. It goes into the cloud. So I do encourage those of you that don't really know how to use a cloud-based software to use it because you can tag people in the document. You can get feedback. They can give you suggestions in the document. And you're never going to be emailing back and forth, you know, 17 copies of this one paper. You just tag them. You say, at Chogi Sock. Hey, Chogi Sock, can you please <laughs> read through this and tell me your thoughts? And he can. He can comment in it. He can make suggestions. He can make revisions to it. And you can see those live in that one document that you've been working on. It's very cool stuff. They should also give me money. Thank you, this is a sponsored post from mind mapping software and cloud drive software. 
Uh, but it is a really good thing to start learning because it will save you a lot of stress, right? It will save you a lot of stress. Okay.